Hello everyone, welcome back to this latest module of the Top Sales Academy 2013. My name is Jonathan Farrington, I'm the CEO of Top Sales World um, and also the joint editor of Top Sales World magazine. For those of you that haven't joined us on any of the previous models of Top Sales Academy, um, please let me give you a brief introduction to what was the entire purpose of this whole exercise and initiative. For those of you that have joined us and were with us all the way through from the beginning, please bear with me. Um, Top Sales Academy came about as a result of a, quite a large group from the Top Sales World contributing team coming together in 2012 and discussing the paucity of sales training, um, the declining standards of, of, of sales professionalism, um, and as uh, sales attainment levels seem to be going dramatically downwards in a in, in, in an obvious spiral, uh, sales team costs, sales costs in general, are actually going the other way. And clearly, this gap is extending. Um, and we only have to look at the results that we got through at the end of Q2, at the end of June. And we noticed that, in fact, only 48% of, of the global sales population were on quota at that point, which is really quite alarming. We weren't surprised because, you know, as I suggested to you, the, the, the decline has been um, continuous over the last three to four years. Um, so as a result, a small group of us formed with the faculty and decided that what we wanted to do we, was address the four levels of salesmanship. That's to say sales management. Then we have inside sales or internal sales if you prefer, external sales, and then finally right at the top end, collaborative and consultative selling. Um, it's our ambition to complete the entire program before the end of 2013. We have already delivered sales management, and of course we are now on, I think this is module four of um, inside sales. <coughs> so without further ado, if we could go to the next slide, please. So you will have noticed, in fact, that I do, I have actually outsourced slide clicking tonight. This is deliberate. Um, our principal sponsor is iMeet, and I, and I have to say to you that, you know, we have been so grateful for the generosity of our sponsors. Uh, for this initiative, and and the effect of that is, for you is that all of the sessions are absolutely free. Now, uh, there is a note from our sponsor, sorry you had to download software to attend this session, for online meetings with zero downloads, the guest contact PGI, PGI of course is the parent of iMeet. Um, don't rush away and try and grab a pencil, or try and type in the uh, link unless you possibly want to, we will be sending you a note out in the next 48 hours with all of our presenters' details, plus details of our sponsors, where you can take a test drive, and I do urge you to take that test drive. Uh, iMeet is a superb um, solution. Okay, on to the next slide, please. As you can see, the faculty is made up of 26 of the world's leading top sales experts and commentators. I won't go through all of them, but those of you that are that regularly move around the sales space will obviously recognize lots and lots and lots of them. Uh, and a jolly good uh, group of chaps they are too. Okay, next slide please. So, as I mentioned, internal sales level, it's running from July 16th to August 15th, 2013. The other thing that you'll notice on that slide is that the inside sales level or the internal sales level has been sponsored by InsideSales.com. So that's Ken Krogan and his team over there who are doing a superb job, and in fact, Ken himself will present, be presenting one of the modules later on in the program. Thank you. The next slide. This is the faculty delivering the internal sales level. So you can see that we've got Trish Bacuzzi, we've got some sort of um, boarding chap from Paris, we've got Colleen Francis, we've got Barb Giamanco, we've got Jill Conrath, we've got Ken Krug, Kendra Lee, Laurie Richardson, Tibor Shanto, and last and certainly not least, Wendy Weiss. Okay, so uh, next slide please. This is module four, as I suggested. It's solving the social selling puzzle. And I'm delighted uh, that Barb Giamanco has agreed to join the um, faculty. Barb actually is a senior member of the Top Sales World contributing team. There are only 50 of us. There will only be 50 of us in any season, which is a, which is a year, so 2013. Um, Barb is also a regular contributor um, and columnist with Top Sales World magazine. So if you get your copy every month, you will be able to read Barb's words of wisdom. I don't think um, I'm very amiss in telling you 
that Barb is amongst the very, very top experts and commentators when it comes to social selling, if not right at the top. Um, she's in huge demand, which really is why we're so grateful to have her with us. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Barb. Welcome, Barb. Thank you, Jonathan. It is always a pleasure, and I really appreciate that very kind and uh, nice introduction. It's great to be here with your group today. Thank you. All right. So we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is solving the social selling puzzle. And I, like a lot of people, have some strong opinions about what it really takes to be successful in this world of social selling. I want to encourage you to keep it interactive. Please chat in any questions that you might have. And I'm going to make sure that I'm breaking throughout the, uh, the, the presentation. And Jonathan will queue up those questions for me. Really want to try and take any questions you have real time. So thanks for joining us today and let's go ahead and get started. Jonathan already told you a little bit about me. Mostly what you need to know is I have a deep background in sales, uh, both as an individual contributor and as a sales director running large sales teams at major corporations before starting my own business. Also have quite a bit of background, same amount of time actually, in technology and I've had the pleasure of seeing technology advance through the years so I'm very excited about where we find ourselves now. If you are tweeting, and I hope you are, I am at Barbara Giamonco, and feel free to use the hashtag pound social selling for any comments that you might have throughout the presentation. The first thing I really want to talk about is this notion of sales disruption. You know, there are some folks who are still kind of resisting this whole idea that the way the buying process is happening today is just like it was 10, 12, 15, or 20 years ago. And the truth is, that's just not the case anymore. I, I've seen a lot of changes through the years, and I can tell you that social technology, just as other technologies before them, have really shaken up the notion of how salespeople need to consider um, proceeding, uh, you know, in terms of uh, reaching those prospects and buyers throughout the process. And so let me tell you one reason why it's so important for you to get this in your head. Whether you're talking to Harvard Business Review or Serious Decisions, uh, CSO Insights, any number of uh, very well-respected professional organizations who focus on the world of sales and business will tell you today that their research absolutely confirms that buyers can begin that buying process without salespeople. If you think about it, I know when I started, you know, our job as sales professionals was to go in, meet with people, educate them about our solution, ask appropriate questions hopefully to find out where their pain points were. And while some of that is applicable today, what's really changed is the ability for a buyer to go out and seek solution information independent of salespeople. So they're doing that through the web and they're going to social networks and they're talking to their peers and they're also doing their homework before we as sales professionals even show up in the sales meeting. So it's very, very different, and I know that salespeople have a hard time with this. I just came back from doing some client work, and, you know, about half the audience was very receptive, and the other half was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. My sales process has always been working for me, so I'm just going to keep doing what I've always done. Well, you know, that's only going to keep working for you for a limited amount of time because the truth is that the traditional techniques that we've come to see throughout the years as being something that salespeople use successfully, like cold calling, is much less effective. In fact, Inside V says some 92% of those buyers will delete a cold call or an email from someone that they don't know. And the other problem is that pitches fall on deaf ears. So buyers really are screening out the noise. You know, they don't want to hear you calling up out of the blue with some generic pitch that's really about your agenda. In other words, you're trying to get something versus really thinking about what's important to the person that you are reaching out to connect with. And so, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, sales is often kind of disconnected from this uh, reality. So I want to talk about this for a minute because in my personal estimation, whatever the good old days were, they're gone. 
we really do have to take the time to think about what's important to the buyer. Now, I personally would argue that we always needed to do that, but now it's even more important because if you want to break through that noise, you have to stand out. And when you use social technology in a way that's very smart and strategic, which I'm going to talk about, you are able to do that. But it starts right here, right? It starts with understanding that a better informed, more connected customer is controlling that buying process. Whether you like it or not, they are in control because they have access to information that's just completely unprecedented. So it's really important that you come from this notion of social selling from the place of recognizing that buyers expect something different. And if you're only using social technology to broadcast a generic sales message, not only are you not really going to get the results that you're looking for, you run the risk of damaging your brand. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about sales messaging and why it's so, so very important. So let's talk about what I believe social selling is. Uh, Jonathan, I and I, it, we've talked about this in interviews and in, in uh, various conversations. And, you know, there are a lot of folks, not unexpectedly, of course, who are calling themselves social selling experts. All right, well, that's great. What does that mean exactly? Well, ask 10 different experts how they define social selling, and I guarantee you, you're going to get a different answer from each person. Personally, how I've been defining social selling for the last few years is that it's a process of using social media as part of your overall sales process, and I see it fitting very, very applicably on the front end where you're networking and you're prospecting and you're doing research before you engage with someone. Hopefully there's an opportunity to collaborate in conversations and then, you know, teach. But what you're really trying to do here is get the opportunity to get the meeting with the buyer having kind of paved the way in terms of your experience, your expertise, and your credibility. And I'm a huge fan of saying that I believe when it really gets right down to it, social selling is the idea of giving first without expecting that immediate sales return. And I know that's pretty counterintuitive for a lot of sales folks. I get it. You've got quotas. You're trying to make your numbers. I am too. But what I'm here to tell you is I know from experience in doing this for the past almost eight years, I can tell you that when you take this approach where you're giving up front and creating value in events of sales opportunities, your prospects naturally want to have that conversation with you. Now the question is how do you go about it? Social also fits obviously on the back end. Once you've got a customer, there are opportunities for you to use uh, tools like LinkedIn and others to continue to build and develop and go deeper in terms of that relationship. Uh, but I want to make it perfectly clear that social empowers sales in terms of getting in, pros in front of prospects more quickly, but what it does not do for you is do the selling. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, and I'm sure people are going to have some questions about this, but frankly, I'm appalled at how selling skills seem to be on the decline with people trying to rely more on technology than they are in recognizing that technology helps enable the process, but it's not the process, and it doesn't replace being a great sales professional who operates really as a trusted advisor. Now, when you think about social selling, how does it empower? Um, you know, again, it's not doing the selling for you, but what it is doing is it's helping you to extend your reach. And what I want to say right here is that I don't advocate that you sit at your desk all day long talking online. Absolutely not. Great offline networking process, uh, you know, approaches still prevail, whether it's speaking on webinars like I'm doing today as a guest of Top Sales World. Uh, it might be speaking at an industry event or uh, speaking as part of a panel. There are all kinds of opportunities for you to get that offline visibility. But what you want to do is you want to think about it in a very smart and intentional way. Now, how do you really succeed? It starts by listening, by identifying those people you want to do business with and or those people that you hope to cultivate referral relationships with, and you start by paying attention to what's important to them. What groups are they part of? What kinds of information do they share? 
Are they asking in a LinkedIn group, as an example, about some challenge they're having in their business? And is there an opportunity for you to weigh in and demonstrate thought leadership without selling? Social also gives you a great ability to engage with people, and I do not mean connect with someone on LinkedIn and immediately crank out a sales pitch. It also gives us unprinted, uh, unprecedented abilities to gain access, I mean, in ways that we just couldn't do 15 years ago. Now we can really, as I said a little bit earlier, we can start to, uh, to, to pave the way. I recently conducted a survey with my good friend and colleague uh, Jim Keenan from the Sales Guy Consulting. We wanted to find out whether or not social media, uh, you know, be, be beyond the return on investment we knew our clients were achieving, we wanted to find out more broadly from the sales community, from sellers, whether or not they were actually gaining success. And it turns out uh, they absolutely were. And the top ways that these sellers are using social, LinkedIn, of course, as being the top tool followed by Twitter and then Facebook and Google Plus and blogging and other. They're using it for the networking, the prospecting, and the research. And interestingly enough, if those sellers have been using um, social media for two years or longer, research actually moved to the number two uh, place in how people were using. You should know that that survey was uh, sort of split between sales management and individual sales contributors, also a pretty even split between those people who were selling to enterprise accounts and those who were selling into um, the small medium business space. So before I just take a quick pause and find out if you have any questions thus far, I, I want you to know that when we did the survey, we looked back three years. So we looked at 2010, 2011, and 2012. Each year, the results absolutely remained consistent. Those salespeople who integrate social media as part of the sales process outperform sales peers. And in fact, they exceed quota more often. So for anyone listening who's still kind of questioning whether or not using social media can generate a very specific sales return, I'm here to tell you that it absolutely does. So. I wanted to just sort of set the stage for the, for the balance of the conversation, and I think it's appropriate to just pause for a moment to see if anyone in our audience has questions. Uh, yes, Bob. I think we've probably, at this juncture, got time just to take two. We have a question from Ali from Boston. Um, I'm assuming that's uh, a, f a female. <clears throat> if it isn't, I apologize. How do you create value and credibility when the reviews on websites are both very positive or negative, and usually never in the middle. Hmm. So if I had to hazard a guess at where that, com that, that question is coming from, it could be when you think about reviews traditionally in terms of the consumer space. In the business-to-business -business space, the way that you can create value is by sharing relevant content that is informative, insightful, and, and gives something to that prospective buyer that helps their business in some way. So in other words, I like to share educational webinars, white papers, case studies. I like it to be a mashup of things that I've written, but I also like to share um, information from trusted leaders and influencers that I follow in the field of sales and social media because I'm here to help advise and provide value. And so that's how I go about it. That's one way. Another way is to be smart about the, the, the groups you choose in LinkedIn. And then as you see various questions come in, you participate in the conversation. And let me again stress, you do not sell but you answer questions in a way that clearly demonstrates you know your stuff, that you're somebody that this person probably wants to have an additional conversation. So that's how I go about it. And the way I kind of heard the question, Jonathan, is that's maybe somebody who's thinking about the reviews that you might find on like a Yelp or any other sort of you know review site. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, that's a great answer, Bob. Uh, Thomas, I think Thomas was on last night's um, webinar with um, one source. Thomas says, does the arrival of social selling mean the death of traditional selling? Oh, gosh. Absolutely not. O only in the sense that I think some of the traditional sort of approaches we would have used before we had the Internet 
and social networks. And, and by that I mean I'm going to come back to this whole business of smiling and dialing and we're just going to call a bunch of strangers and we're going to say the same script over and over again. To me, as part of selling, that's the piece that really needs to change. But again, you know, you, Thomas, that's a great question because you went, once you connect with that buyer and you're going to have that sales conversation, you absolutely still have to have what I consider uh, very strong interpersonal and consultative selling skills. But you do not go into the meeting and again, fire off the pitch talking about how great you are, your product is, the history of your company. You know, it really is more of a partnership, I would say. Yes, and if I can just add to that, Barb, I mean, you and I have discussed on, on several occasions recently the fact that, you know, there's an awful lot of bad advice going around at the moment. Yes. In other words, a lot, of, a lot of people are suggesting, okay, if you switch on to social media, you switch on to social selling, forget everything else you need to know, that's it. It is a panacea for everything. And of course, as we've agreed, social selling and social media is just a part, it's just one weapon in the frontline sales professionals armory, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Uh, you know, and that's the thing that, that, that's the reason why I was so excited about having the opportunity to have a conversation, you know, with, uh, with you, Jonathan, and top sales world folks who are joining us today. Because it is this, you know, I get it. People are looking for shortcuts, but they don't exist. And, you know, you know, hopping onto LinkedIn and having a profile isn't going to do the selling for you. And so it is, um, you know, troublesome to me that there is a lot of noise out there that says, hey, if you just get on a social network, that's all you need. Absolutely not. You know, if, if what you say and do once you get in front of that buyer is not smart selling, then you're not going to close the deal. So the technology, just like CRM systems, they don't sell for you. You know, it's the same sort of thing. So I think of technology in that way, Jonathan, is it's like putting gas in the car. It kind of gets you to the destination. But what you do when you get there makes all the difference in the world. No, absolutely, Bob. I'm, I'm, I'm right on the same length of waves with you. Um, okay, uh, thanks very much for those questions, everyone. Do keep them coming. Use that uh, message box, and we'll have another Q&A session with Barb towards the end. Over to you again, Barb. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jonathan, and thanks for the questions, guys. Keep them coming. So we just did kind of a little bit of a setup for what I believe is really the success formula for social selling. Now, I haven't cornered the market on the definition, but I do believe it's process, right? Great selling is process anyway. And what we're talking about is we're talking about integrating social as part of that process. And for me, in order to have a very successful process, it starts by having a strategy. You've really got to think strategically about what you want to accomplish. If you're a sales leader listening in today, then you need to step back and think about what is the strategic approach you want your sales organization to take in terms of leveraging social networks like LinkedIn or Twitter um, to sell more. And there are some things that go into that. There's some deep questions that have to be answered, not the least of which is, you know, um, what kind of content do we have queued up from marketing to share with our people? Uh, you know, do we have social media policies in place and do our folks understand how to use the technology? Are we clear which platform really fits the, the, the buyer who is best suited for us. I'll give you a great example of why that's important. You know, uh, mid last year, everybody got fired up about Pinterest. They got all worked up about Pinterest. I love the Pinterest platform. It has huge applicability. It's very visual. I really love the platform. And it really applies to those types of businesses that might be more consumer oriented, more visually oriented, you know, um, uh, cars, uh, weddings, uh, hospitality, whatever it might be. That doesn't mean as a business to business seller you couldn't use Pinterest. But it probably, depending on the industry you sell into, would have a lot less applicability. And yet, the buzz last year was, oh, everybody has to be on Pinterest. Listen, anytime anybody tells you you have to be on some platform, I ask you to step back and really ask them to tell you why. So your strategy has to consider all of these things. And it also includes making sure you're very clear on who your buyer is. It is not everyone with a pulse. 
And when you're in the social world, you have to think about how you're going to craft your messaging and what that approach is going to be. The next piece is do your people, and if you're an individual contributor, this applies for you to be thinking about all three of these things, but do your folks have the skills? Do they have the right technology skills? In other words, do they really understand how to use LinkedIn or Twitter or blogging or any number of uh, social networking tools that might be applicable? Do you really understand how to use the tool in a very smart way so that you achieve those sales objectives? But as we also talked about, the other piece is you've got to have the great selling skills. Um, you need them both. It's not one or the other, and so I think that's critically important. And then third, it's about the execution and doing that on a very consistent basis. You know, if you put up a LinkedIn profile and you never do anything with it and you, you know, yeah, you go back periodically, or let's say you put that profile up three years ago and you've never revamped the summary, then you're really missing some very key opportunities. So execution is both keeping those profiles relevant and fresh, but it's also uh, following the process for your uh, lead generation and prospecting. It's also making sure that you're consistently participating in the right forums and in the right way. So, you know, I think you need all three. What concerns me, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, is so much of the noise is about, oh, just hop on LinkedIn and all you need is a well-crafted profile and a few intentionally placed keywords and join all 50 groups. And man, you're on your way. You're going to start busting out the sales numbers. No way. This takes work. You know, this takes, uh, again, strategic thinking. This takes making sure that you've got the right skills. This takes understanding what's important to the buyer you're trying to connect with. And I can assure you, if you use any of these social technologies as a megaphone to simply crank out a generic email that just talks about how awesome you are and why you think your product is so great, you do two things. One, you can just pretty much guess or, uh, you know, as, um, expect that someone would delete it, ignore you, and move on. Worse, you're going to create the opposite brand impression that you're really going for. People will perceive you as, as, as you know, from a negative perspective. If you ever want to have some fun, you can go read my blog. Um, unlike some of my colleagues, I uh, do not call people out. However, I do post real-time sales messages that come to me that are so horrible, I ask myself, where are the sales managers and why aren't they reading the messages that their salespeople are cranking out on behalf of the organization? So as I already mentioned, you know, technology doesn't sell for you, my friends. It really doesn't. And you don't necessarily even need all of these. You don't necessarily need Twitter or Facebook and Google+. Plus. If you're in B2B selling, you need LinkedIn, and you need to really think, um, you know, take some classes, come to some of my complimentary webinars, learn how to use that tool because it's pretty powerful in terms of creating lead generation lists and opportunities and engaging by sharing content participating in those groups. But don't feel like you have to have all of these things in your toolkit. Start with one and get good at it. I would then say you want to look very, very smartly at Twitter. A lot of people balk at Twitter, but I'm here to tell you that you need to set up a Twitter account and even if you never tweet, your ability to leverage information, follow your prospects so you have another vehicle for understanding what they're talking about and what's important to them. Uh, you know, follow your competitors. You can set up private lists where you can follow competition and see what they're talking about. Um, you know, follow influencers in the field and get connected with them. As you do that, you build your influence. You also build a very strong referral network, which I'm a huge proponent of as is my good friend and colleague and mentor, Joanne Black. Right? So when Thomas asked the question about, is traditional selling done? Absolutely not. What I love about technology is it's another way. We can build a stronger referral network. We have more opportunities for securing introductions. You know, we have lots of ways of actually getting to people more quickly. So recognize that making 100 phone calls to the wrong people with the wrong message, that's not sales effectiveness. It's better if you specifically target 
who you want to get in front of and why, and then go about the strategic process of identifying who can help you get into the organization. We already talked about this a little bit. The common mistakes really break down into these particular areas, in my opinion. The broadcast spam, which I've talked about, the poor spelling, uh, scaling, excuse me, spelling skills, and, and not being adding any value, right? So if you want to add value and you want to engage with someone, here's an example. Let's say that I want to connect with Jonathan, and he's an ideal buyer for me, and I want to sit down with him, right? He's the right C-level executive, and I want to have that conversation. Let's say Jonathan and I have started up a little bit of a conversation in a group, and he accepts my invitation to connect. Awesome. The worst thing that could happen is my very next move is to say, hey, Jonathan, thanks for the connect. I'd love to set up a meeting to talk about how we might be able to help your business. That's the wrong approach. What you want to do is take a little bit of time to continue to develop that relationship. And it doesn't have to take long, but I know a little bit about Jonathan, so now I'm going to be on the watch for information that's important to him. And or when the time comes, I might reach out to Jonathan with something like, Jonathan, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know you. Hopefully the information we've been exchanging has been of value. Listen, I wanted to let you know, I just came across a survey I think is really going to be important to your top sales world members. No selling, but I'd love to have an opportunity to just share those insights with you if you have 15 minutes. That's a completely different approach than right out of the gate trying to get a sales meeting because Jonathan will know all I'm looking to do is get what I can get. And so you really have to think about approaching this in a completely different way. Now, Jonathan, before I kind of leave folks with, you know, sort of my prescription, if you will, to kind of summarize what we've been talking about, let's just check in and see if we've got any other questions that we could take from the audience. Yeah, we do, Bob. Um, absolutely. Um, we've got a question here from Janet. Uh, she said, Bob, you haven't so far mentioned blogs. How important is that in an overall social strategy? Ah, well, here's what I would say. I believe blogging is really important. Um, I happen to enjoy it, uh, so some people are a little concerned about it. I think the answer to the question depends on a couple of things. One, uh, probably the organization you work in and whether or not they have a corporate marketing team responsible for blogging. So that's the first thing. So if that's the case, and some of my customers have that situation. See if you can't build up a relationship with them and allow um, you know, them to let you be a guest blogger on your own corporate site. If you're more independent like I am, um, sure, I would say think about starting your own blog. I mean, Jonathan's probably going to have some thoughts here. He's done a tremendous job with his own blog. But what I want you to know is blogging doesn't have to just be writing. A lot of people think, oh my gosh, I'm not a good writer. I'm just not really going to be good at this. Listen, you could record audio podcasts. You could record uh, video clips. Uh, you know, there, there's a couple different ways to, to go about it. And I would also say if you're new to it, one way to start out that's a little less threatening, and this is what I did some years back, I found a couple of industry blogs that were very popular, that had big audiences and fit my brand, and I started replying, right? In other words, I started commenting on various blogs, and I started in getting myself into the conversation, but I also got visibility that way. And then when I got more comfortable with the strategy, I started um, doing that on a more regular basis. The final thing I'll say about blogging, and again, I, want, I know Jonathan's probably got some thoughts here too, don't do it unless you're prepared to manage it, right? I've seen a lot of blogs that got started in 2010 and you haven't seen a post since then. So if you're going to do it, it's about having a level of consistency, uh, but blogging can be um, helpful in so many ways, including um, bumping up search engine rankings and bringing more people to your website, to your, uh, you know, your social profiles, etc. I couldn't agree more, Bob, and, and as you suggest, yes, I, I would like to add something. I mean, I'm, I think I've been blogging all, for almost seven years, so one of, the, one of the sort of early pioneers within the sales space to get online, and we're up to almost 2,000 blog posts. Now, what have been the advantages? Well, um, if I were to tell you I get, on average, five or six RFPs as a direct result of someone reading a post or reading my blog regularly, 
um, each month. So in other words, uh, you know, typically the, 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 the note will be, Jonathan, I've been reading your blog for blah, 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 weeks or months or even years actually, um, and we've got an opportunity coming up. We need to do this, this, and this. Um, would you be interested in talking to us about it? Um, and, and then, you know, the RFP follows. Um, so if you think about that, what's gone on there? You know, we've, we've, you very eloquently um, illustrated, Barb, the fact that buyers are coming in 60 to 80 percent, you know, higher up the food chain now, and, and we all accept that. Um, and what I've done, really, by blogging, if you think about it, I've, moved, I've removed virtually most of the foreplay stage completely. Um, you know, people are, organizations are coming to me and saying, okay, I enjoyed this, I enjoyed that, and they've read the blog and they've thought, okay, well, yeah, uh, we, think he, we think he knows what he's talking about or what he's talking about fits in with our psychographics and our way of doing business or, you know, a whole host of reasons. Um, and so from that point, it's been hugely beneficial. But I would highlight something else, and I don't think many people um, think about this that are blogging. Every day I blog, and, and you made the point, Barb, and it's a very important one. If you're going to if you're going to write a blog, make sure you post regularly. It doesn't have to be every day. I mean, you don't have to be that committed like I am. I, I do it because I find it cathartic. Um, but but w whatever you do, post regularly. Keep it up to date. Keep keep the whole thing modern and and you know, stay, stay in tune with it. Um, and I find that I think about uh, more than 80% of my clients um, at various levels through salespeople and sales management and up to the sea lounge read my blog on a regular basis. So in fact, it's another way for me to communicate with my existing clients on a regular basis, which is hugely valuable. Um, and you'd be amazed how often I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm communicating with a client the next day, and they'll say, "Oh yeah, I read your post yesterday, Jonathan. Yeah, really enjoyed that." Um, blah. Or they'll say something like, "You know, I didn't, I didn't quite agree with that." And I say, "Okay, well, let's debate it." And we talk it, we talk about it, and it's just a, a superb conversation opener. Um, and you know, it, 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 I, I can say nothing but good about blog posting. Okay, we've got another question, Barb. Um, is it your view that organizations working in B2C environment should have a completely different social strategy to those working in B2B? Well, I, I think the answer is probably yes, because your strategy always comes back to who's your audience. So if you're working in a, in a classic uh, business-to-consumer environment, we have several customers who operate in that space, then you're going to probably leverage something like Facebook a little bit more intentionally. You're going to probably put a lot more attention on that Facebook fan page. You're probably going to have that uh, co-joined and connected with your strategy related to Pinterest and or Instagram. So I would say yes, because, you know, and that, that's the reason why I am so outspoken about how important it is to take the time to craft that strategy because not all social platforms are designed to hit the same audience. And that's why it's so important to think about it. So yes, business to consumer, depending on the type of consumer orientation, perhaps you're leveraging LinkedIn a little bit less. I wouldn't say ignore LinkedIn, but perhaps that's not the first platform you're really investing the majority of your time. So again, it comes back to the audience. What does the audience care about? Where do they tend to be participating? Um, what forums are they in? And you know, people are making a lot of assumptions, and they're often wrong. And so you could be investing a ton of time in one particular platform, and then all of a sudden you realize, geez, I'm not even talking to my audience. They're not even here. Great example. I love Facebook. I have my personal Facebook page, which I keep personal. I don't discuss business there. It's friends, it's family, it's personal. But we do have a business fan page and that's where I will share um, you know, various information. The reality is I have a smaller audience there. I've got to have the presence because of the type of business that I'm in. The reality is though my C-level executive is a VP of sales. 
or it might be the vice president or director of, uh, you know, the sales learning and development. And they're not hanging out on my Facebook fan page all day. I'm having conversations with them over on LinkedIn. So excellent question, and it just illustrates the point why taking the time to develop the strategy is so critical. Yes, I think that's absolutely spot on, Bob. And, and I'm very much the same. I, I don't really spend too much time over at Facebook. I, as I'm, I'm quoted as saying very often, I pop over occasionally to see what my children are up to, and that's about it. And the reason I don't go over there very often is simply because, in commercial terms, my clients and my prospects aren't on Facebook. And I think that's the point. And you use the word relevant, and that is an absolutely key word. What we have to do is to find out where our clients and our prospects are hanging out and then make sure that we are there too. We must not make, again, another word you use, Barb, assumptions. We can't set out our, our, our social media strategy or social selling strategy without thinking about our clients and prospects and even involving them in our strategy so that we make sure that we've got all the bases covered. Yeah? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, you know, and, and the other thing that I would say is, you know, when you think about your messaging, you also need to understand the platforms and the nomenclature. And here's what I mean by that. Nothing makes me crazier than to see someone sharing information on LinkedIn that was clearly fed through their Twitter account. How do I know that? Because I can see hashtags. If you don't know what that is, a hashtag is simply the pound symbol with a topic, pound social selling. Or they might be referencing, you know, a message, ah, oh, thanks, at Top Sales World, right, which is the Top Sales World, um, you know, uh, Twitter moniker. And they might be referencing that message. And I see that happening on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And it makes me kind of crazy because really, although Facebook is starting to become a little more popular, it still just feels wrong to me. I mean, that's the nomenclature of Twitter. So if you want to, and, and, and so I'm a big fan of using tools like Hootsuite to or organize and schedule messaging. But when I do that, um, because uh, if you don't know Hootsuite, it's a great tool for letting you talk to uh, several different social sites at once. But the mistake is that a lot of people make is they take one message and they blast it across all platforms. And you don't want to do that. I mean, again, we're talking relevance. We're talking about thinking about the audience. And you want to make sure that your messaging kind of reflects that you understand the um, landscape, if you will, in terms of each of these platforms. Okay, Bob, we're moving towards the witching hour. Would you like to make your closing um, comments? Sure, absolutely. So just sort of the prescription here, and it's not difficult, right? It's not difficult. It's just that because it takes a little bit of time and a little thinking, uh, people often neglect the step. Start with a plan. Define what your prospect cares about. Create those goals and establish metrics. That's another thing. Metrics are really important, and it's more than, oh, I want to get from 500 LinkedIn connections to 1,000. You know, you want to establish metrics that are actually leading to sales results, net new sales meetings as one example. You want to think about the strategies you're going to use, and then you'll determine your tactics. The problem is most people go right to tactics, and that's usually a recipe for disaster. As we've been talking about, determine the message. How are you different? Don't, don't tell me that there's a reason why McKesson and Bain Capital and American Express use your product. Don't tell me that you just got VC infusion of X thousands, millions of dollars. I don't care. You need to speak to your buyer in the language of what's important to them. And usually they care about what saves them time, makes them money, or saves them money, right? So think about the results and how are you different. How will you use content? Will it be yours? Will it be somebody else's? Um, and sales leaders, I can't stress enough how important it is to review those messages salespeople are sending out. Should not be sending the sales message to everyone. You think about the technology that best fits, as we've talked about, and then you want to assess the sales and social media skills and determine training, right, and establish a schedule of ongoing reinforcement. I, I don't know why it is the training is often thought of as a one-time event, but trust me, a one-time LinkedIn training and got to cut it. This is, a, this is an initiative that requires reinforcement over a period of time. So, you know, if I can leave the group with anything, if they haven't really picked up my passion in this particular area, it's that... There are no shortcuts. My goodness, I wish there really were, but there are no shortcuts 
to being great at what you do. And social, thinking about how to use social media and the nuances of communication and how you're going to approach people. And there are some unspoken rules and netiquette that you need to understand and follow. Otherwise, you really risk doing more harm than good. So I really hope you will take a step back and ask yourself what you're trying to accomplish and, and, and follow the prescription that I've shared because it's just so vitally important. And I, I know that when you do that, you will get the success you're looking for. And frankly, you'll actually achieve it more quickly than I think you think might be possible. So there you go. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jonathan. I don't know if there are any final questions, but let me turn it back over to you for a few moments. Well, it's very good. I mean, that was superb. We do share your passion, Barb. And if I can give you an indication of, of how I know that the audience has shared your passion, we've actually got more on the call now than when we started. Nobody has gone. They've been riveted to their PCs. So well, <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to share my thoughts about this. Because as you know, Jonathan, in my heart, I know it works and I want people to be successful. And I know that there's a prescription for doing that. And so I hope everybody will take a, a step back and think about that and put these things into application in their own business. Yeah, me too. Now, what I, what I would say to everybody, there's, there's a, some very interesting information on that final slide of how you can make contact with Barbara. There's details about uh, her book, The New Handshake, Sales Meets Social Media. Please don't worry about scribbling it all down. We will be sending you a note out within the next 48 hours um, on all of the contact details and any links that were in the presentation. Okay. Um, so, Barb, I'm afraid you're back into your secondary role and you're doing it so superbly. You really have been, I think, one of the best slide clickers we've ever had on Academy. So, <laughs> congratulations. Woohoo! I win the award. <laughs> so, I do want to thank again our sponsor for the Inside Sales uh, level, which is InsideSales.com. I mentioned Ken Krug and he will be pre presenting later. And also, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Barb, our principal sponsor, I meet, again, their products are absolutely superb. and you know, make sure you use that link, please. Take a test drive, take that free demonstration. Uh, if, if you are in inside sales and you're conducting online meetings, you need to have a look at that product, that is for sure. Okay, thank you, Barb. So coming next, module five. Uh, we're working on Tuesdays and Thursdays, as you know, every week, one o'clock Eastern, that's six o'clock GMT, or BST as it is now. So coming up next on Module 5 is the Queen of Cold Calling, six things you need to know before you call another prospect. It's very updated thinking for anyone who's involved with cold calling, warm calling, or any other sort of calling. And as you can see, as we work through the rest of the modules, we've got Kendra Lee, we've got Jill Conrad, Trish Patuzzi, Ken Krug, and then I finish it up with providing you with the characteristics of top inside sales pros. And this is based on... One of the advantages I have to tell you of getting old is you gain experience and uh, having trained uh, more than 100,000 uh, frontline sales professionals, I think what I've been able to do is to come up with a profile of the most successful and I'm going to be sharing those secrets with you on that final module, module 10. I really hope you've enjoyed today's presentation um, and I, I really hope you think like me that Barb really is at the, at the, at the vanguard of social selling and, and social media thinking. Um, and we're delighted that she's joined us. I hope you're enjoying also everything that's going over on Top Sales World. <clears throat> Do be aware that Top Sales World provides updated and fresh material resources every single day. There are articles, there are tips, there are videos, there are recordings, and it's absolutely free. And our primary objective has always been from day one to keep continually raising that bar in terms of what's going on in the sales space. That is our total commitment. And if you even have half a mind to be the best that you can possibly be, then please come and join us on a regular basis. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Jonathan Farrington. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.